welcome to Tech Talks. This is, um, I don't even know which installment, 20 something, maybe 30th installment of our web series that started at the beginning of the pandemic. And we've had a lot of good feedback from you folks that said, keep going, don't stop, even if we get back to in-person meetings. Uh, I do want you to know that the webinar series was to keep you informed and to continue to give you your continuing education credit opportunities. So we will send you PDH certificates after this webinar. But another purpose for the webinar series is to schedule either in-person meetings or direct meetings with your company that could be virtual, where I'd be happy to host them and we could have our guest speaker today, Lance Hoff, participate. And instead of being a webinar where you don't get to talk, you'll, we'll have open mic. It'll just be a virtual meeting like you're used to already and probably tired of, but we can talk specifically about your project and put it up on screen and help you. There's no obligation there, but we, you know, we used to call them lunch and learns, but now if we're not coming to your office for lunch, um, if you wanna do that, let me know, we still do that. But if you wanna do a virtual lunch and learn or breakfast or afternoon, whatever, we can certainly do that. So I am Bill Murphy, our civil engineer, and I do represent ASP Enterprises, Quick Supply Company, Bowman Construction Supply, and Cascade Geosynthetics. I'll show a map here in a little bit where we're at. And ASP Enterprises is actually celebrating 45 years to this year, and you'll start to see some of that on the ASP, ASP folks' uh, email signatures and some other places. Pretty proud of that. Uh, Quick Supply has been around a long time, so is Bowman. Cascade is relatively new. We started Cascade up last year with some veterans in the industry, and they're out in Portland, Oregon. I'll get to that, but we do have a lot of great salespeople that are professionals in what they do, and they can provide expert advice. They bring me in if they need engineering advice. Uh, most of our products, they don't, and we do have over 12,000 customers now and plenty of CPESC. So here's a map of the United States that shows the areas we cover. I don't know, just get a hold of me or Madeline or click on the website. We always uh, stay in touch with each other every day. We're really one company. We just kept our identity names the same since we've been in business for so long. And here's some contact information for each of us. You know us from one or many of these different industries and we're experts in all of them and more. And our parent company is even in the mining and explosives business, that's Quick Supply Company. And we're blessed to have a lot of professionals in a lot of areas that work really well together as a team. It's really exciting how in the last six and a half years that I've been with the company, uh, technology has helped us feel like we're all in not just one company, but in one place. We stay in touch so well. We are experts at storing our uh, supplies. I can promise you none of these are pictures of my personal garage. I'm not that tidy and organized. I'm very impressed with our in-house sales and our warehouse staff and our drivers. We're blessed with um, excellent team uh, experts in logistics. I just created this slide this morning because I wanted to make sure people understand that what I talk about is stormwater primarily and erosion control, water quality, green infrastructure, low impact development, but we are very good at everything that we do. And we're really well known to be able to deliver exactly what a client needs, when they need it, where they need it. And that's tough to do um, today because we're competing with so many of those companies that people just buy online and get one thing at a time, but we're very good at providing everything you need for a project. Today, I'm gonna to focus my attention on stormwater and I do some public speaking around the country for low impact development and green infrastructure. And I like to remind people that we are just a very tiny part of this system. And so we can only affect change where we can practically, realistically, uh, physically and financially. And that is mostly in surface runoff. And that's where we take the stormwater that has been impacted by civilization development. And, you know, every time we put up a hard surface or we change the natural environment, that does create an impact. And we try to lessen that impact. Really, we're trying to get back to nature. Give thanks to Pat Sauer and the Iowa Stormwater Education Program. They use this graphic without the text on it. I added those words. They use this graphic in their educational pieces, and I'm told it comes from Doug Adamson, and he did it on behalf of the Polk County Soil and Water Conservation District. I like you to look at this as I tell the story. There's nothing to take notes on here yet, but we talk about green infrastructure and low impact development, and we are part of a lot of organizations that are doing the best they can to improve those efforts. It is constantly growing and evolving. We are forever students, and let's be life, lifelong learners, and I hope you all learned something here today. On the right is what we traditionally do. I'm a civil engineer, have been for more than 25 years. We take a whole lot of surface water runoff and we put it into inlets, intakes, manholes, get it into a pipe and run it downhill as quickly as we can, trying to reduce flooding on the street. And we end up creating quite a tough spot there at the bottom of the hill. And it's not always the bottom of the hill. Sometimes it's right next to a building. 
and then people call and say, help, we need help from Quick Supply, ASP, Bowman, and Cascade with erosion control problems. Um, the water quality is an issue, and a lot of communities are trying to do something about it after the fact. Now, if they if they have the ability and the time and the, and the forth, foresight to use green infrastructure and low impact development from the beginning, they can take these little gulps throughout the development and clean the water as they go. That's not to say we give up on the right side. We don't give up on traditional gray infrastructure that's conventional methods. There's something we can do about it. And Lance Hoff has come up with that solution. And I just show this because I want people to understand their why. Again, nothing to take notes on here, but we're guilty of the top two pictures and we're responsible for the bottom three pictures. And these are not my pictures. Actually, they are. The bottom right one is mine. Uh, I took my daughter on a mission trip to Central America. I've a, done a couple of those and I've done a whole lot of them in the United States, um, especially down in the Southern states. But whatever we do here does impact someone else downstream. And there's an old ad that uh, if you're old like me and have a little gray hair, uh, used to have Hootie the Owl or whatever his name, Woodsy the Owl, I'm sorry, Hootie's from something else. Woodsy the Owl said, give a hoot, don't pollute. Pretty catchy. And we kind of got away from that. But we really need to do it better because it's so hard to clean out underground detention systems existing storm sewer systems throughout a city and downstream receiving waters. That top right picture comes from Chad Pagracki at Living Lands and Waters, and he has dedicated his entire life to try to remove debris, trash, other pollutants from uh, America's waters. And the receiving waters uh, in my area is primarily the Mississippi River, but a whole lot of rivers that lead to it. Uh, that's really late in the game, and by then you're only going to grab a percentage of it, and the rest of it's going to go on downstream. So with that, I want to introduce you to Lance Hoff. You see his picture there. Lance was kind enough to send me his bio last night, and I saved it on my phone, and I'm looking for it now, trying to stall a little bit. Uh, he started as, he is a civil engineer. He started his engineering career at a large municipal consulting firm in Minneapolis, St. Paul. He gained experience on a wide variety of water resources projects over his decade tenure, ranging from detailed design to master planning. So he knows all about the slides I just showed. And he subsequently was recruited by a stormwater product manufacturer and rep. Boy, his, his career and mine have really paralleled each other. I also started out as a consultant, and I also was recruited into the stormwater world. Uh, Lance is now the sole, he was the sole engineer at that uh, product manufacturer, responsible for support of their water quality devices and underground storage systems. And his, during his five years there, he became intimately familiar with the stormwater product industry. And he can tell you the same thing I did. It is evolving. And thanks to people like Lance, it's getting better day by day. And he started his own company, Momentum Environmental. And I was happy to meet him right shortly after he did that. And he was a consulting firm originally for stormwater product manufacturers. But then he began R&D for the preserver. And I'm excited to have you learn about it. So I'll stop talking and I'll have Lance tell you and explain to you how it's such a, an effective and affordable gravity separator. Lance, I see you're unmuted and please take over. I will hand you the controls. <laughs> Say hello to your friends. Hi, everybody. Yeah, thank you for joining us today. Uh, thank you for the introduction to you, Bill. Let's uh, jump into this here. Um, so the title slide here, you'll see the main takeaways at the bottom. We'll, we'll repeat this a couple of times, but. Um, this really is, uh, you know, for pretreatment in general. Uh, we are going to be talking about uh, using the preserver as pretreatment. It can be used to meet numeric goals. Um, however, I don't necessarily think that's the best use. It's usually used as pretreatment, um, and I'll talk more about that later. But uh, we like to think of, of pretreatment as a good engineering practice for the other reasons listed. Um, it reduces maintenance costs, long-term maintenance costs, um, provides an easy and inexpensive point of maintenance, um, also protects the downstream BMP so that they, <clears throat> they can function better to do what they were designed for. They're not being overloaded with sediment. Um, and the preserver really is just a, a real popular option for structural pretreatment. Uh, so what is the preserver? Really consists of two components. Uh, what we're showing here is uh, uh, a structure basically with a sump manhole, which is depth below the outlet pipe. We've got the inlet here is number one, outlet number two. Uh, we do need an inlet for the dissipator, which is number four, our energy dissipator. Uh, we'll talk about what each of these uh, two components does in detail here following this. Uh, so we have the en energy dissipator on the inlet or inlets into the structure and then a skimmer um, at the outlet. So what is the, 
the problem um, that we're trying to solve. And um, it, with pretreatment in general, what we're trying to do is just prevent all that uh, sediment, which you know fills up our either conveyance, our pipes, uh, or our downstream BMPs. In regards to structural pretreatment options, a real popular option for decades was just a sump manhole. Uh, similar to the preserver, it makes sense to you know, take your last structure before it discharges into your downstream BMP or receiving water. Add a sump to it, capture sediment, um, and, and create a, a point of maintenance. Uh, however, in the past, and what we see as a problem with sump manholes, uh, just simple sump manholes, is that uh, what happens during the high flows? They can capture sediment during low flows, uh, but once you get that high flow, we see that a lot of that material um, that's been captured previously washes out. Uh, I do want to take this this chance to, I'll, I'll, I'll probably talk about scour a lot. And when I talk about scour, that is the, you know, during high flows, what happens in a structure um, to previously captured material. Um, when I say scour, that means it's it's resuspending into the water column and it's washing out of the outlet. So uh, save a little time. Instead of saying resuspension, wash out, I'll, I'll just be saying scour. So we use the energy dissipator to address this problem. The, primarily, the problem of what happens during high flows um, in a, in a, in comparison to a, a sump manhole, we can correct that by adding an energy dissipator at the inlet or inlets. Um, so just going down the list here, uh, Preserver Energy Dissipator provides an easy, low cost point of maintenance. And that, that's key too um, for uh, pretreatment, a structural pretreatment device to um, really do what it's supposed to do. It has to be number one, effective, it has to work. Um, number two, it has to be cost effective has to come in at a price point where it does make sense um, that your overall maintenance costs, long-term maintenance costs are reduced over time. And we can show that with the preserver. Uh, eliminates washout of previously captured solids. Like I said, it has to be effective. It has to work. Um, double sediment removal. This is something we saw with our testing. You know, the primary goal um, in developing the preserver energy, di energy dissipator was to eliminate that washout during high flows. But during your smaller events, uh, your smaller flows, your, your more common storms, uh, we also see that for the same reason that it stops scour at high flows, it's also enhancing uh, sediment removal at low flows. Uh, it comp accommodates pipe diameters up to 48 inch. Um, <clears throat> and this is a good, good time to talk about the materials it's made out of. So um, primarily made out of two materials. Uh, it's all stainless steel brackets and hardware. Um, and then the black material you see in the picture here, that's uh, HDPE, 100% recycled HDPE is what we use. So that the HDPE was, is really, uh, was we, we looked at several materials, even making the entire thing out of stainless steel at the outset. However, the HDPE gives us some advantages in that, say for a 48 inch pipe, our dissipator dimensions are over seven feet tall and over eight feet wide. Um, and if you look down here, what we're trying to do is make it retrofitable and to fit through a casting so that if you have a sump manhole that isn't working well, you can add these components in and enhance the, the performance of a, a standard sump manhole. So to, to get a, uh, a piece or a, a, a component in that's that large, we really had to either uh, piece it out um, or, be able to roll it up and the advantage of being able to roll it up is that the uh, design that we're using and selling is the exact same design that we developed and tested uh, whereas if we were going to piece it out to get it to fit through a, a 24 inch casting i don't think we would have been able to do that um, especially not for the bigger components so so that hdp material um is very good for that. The other thing it provides is, is very good durability. So we're in our uh, seventh year of selling, no damage or failures um, at all. So uh, extremely durable material uh, and, and suits the purpose of this application extremely well. So um, the other thing that we do, um, and we changed this about two years into uh, selling the preserver is we made it adjustable. So 
uh, you know, it would be great if when we looked at contractors work, it looked like this and your pipe came in flush to the manhole wall. <laughs> However, we all know that that isn't the case. Um, and what, what we usually see is a pipe protruding into the structure <clears throat> and then it's, you know, mudded or grouted um, you know, around that. So we do need to account for variable pipe protrusions. The other thing that we like to do is allow some flex install flexibility uh, for where the brackets are located. Say if you have um, steps or obstructions in the structure, we can move the brackets in or out to avoid that. A contractor and in the install instructions just directed to move them evenly in and out. The, the dissipator is going to function um, just as well either way. So we have a, a lot of flexibility to uh, work around pipe protrusions, make sure the dissipator is located where um, it's designed to work correctly. Uh, that's another benefit of the HDP material, really. Uh, we already talked about that retrofitability, uh, the structural capacity. So again, right from the outset, we wanted to make sure we didn't have any problems with uh, these going in and uh, experiencing uh, high, high forces and high flows from um, large infrequent storms. So um, it's very conservative, conservatively designed. Uh, we basically, to reach the, the design loads, um, we, we assume 10 feet of head uh, pressurized flow through a pipe and our factors of safety are added to that. So it's a big part of why we really haven't seen uh, any problems structurally with, with either component. Uh, each component was designed and tested to function alone or in tandem. So the dissipator with the skimmer um, works as well as a dissipator alone in this case. Third-party verified performance, that's both our lab testing, which I'll talk more about in a bit, as well as um, a monitoring program that we do. We, have, we use a third-party, uh, independent third-party to monitor certain locations, um, also take sediment samples, follow the chain of command to drop off to the laboratory, analyze what's in the structure at the end of the year. Um, and we could talk a little bit more about that later too. Another design aspect, we wanna make sure it's easy to install, access, inspect, and maintain. So we do get a lot of good feedback, both from contractors who are installing it. It's very easy to install, as well as uh, typically city maintenance personnel that like, uh, basically we've designed it so that it, no matter where the casting's located, you can fit a back hose between the structure wall and the component, making sure that the entire sump is accessible for uh, cleaning and maintenance, access, inspection. <clears throat> so just to kind of emphasize the effectiveness of the dissipator at preventing scour, kind of we'll look, look at it compared to some other uh, basically common devices on the market. So like we talked about a standard sump manhole on the left, um, what we see is that basically you have water coming in and it wants to just shoot directly to the outlet um, unobstructed during high flows right so what happens is you eventually create the circular flow pattern and it scours out previously settled uh, material now testing <clears throat> we're doing apples to apples testing here this is all done uh, using uh, at the university of minnesota hydraulics laboratory and i'll, I'll kind of talk a little bit more about that methodology later but um, so all apple samples, same size structures, um, the same high flow rate. We're talking about 16 CFS in a lab environment here. At that flow rate, same same structure dimensions, a sump manual, um, the effluent concentrations, how much material washed out um, was uh, ranging between 200 and 600 milligrams per liter in this controlled lab environment. Now, the University of Minnesota also tested a whole bunch of different proprietary treatment structures. You know, those, those structures often uh, utilize swirling or uh, vortex flow pattern to enhance sediment removal, um, and which, which they do during low flows. So the downside of a, a swirl separator or a vortex uh, separator is that during the high flows, um, they can exacerbate scour, which you can see here. So um, in comparison to a sump manhole, uh, 
a swirl separator can can uh, make scour much worse. So when you're looking at this on kind of an annual basis, and and that's kind of what's important, right? We're usually maintaining these structures once a year. Um, what what's in the structure at the end of the year when you go to maintain it? That's really what matters. So depending on how many large storm events you get, the duration of those storms dictates how much material washes out in between the smaller storms where you're collecting sediment. So how much the, these effluent concentrations or the scour plays a part depends on your rainfall patterns, but typically in areas other than the West Coast, um, we have uh, intense rainstorms and, and the scour plays a big part in annualized removal efficiencies. So you compare that to the test results for the preserver. The preserver at 16 CFS had uh, fifth, average 15 milligrams per liter um, effluent concentration. That was uh, out of all the tests that we did at 16 CFS, the vari variation between results on that is very minor. I think our highest was 17 milligrams per liter and our lowest was 13 or so. So um, in comparison to the other uh, examples, much, much lower, right? Almost eliminated scour, but also very consistent. Um, the other thing I want to point out is um, for those that are familiar or use in your area, the NJTP um, testing protocol um, to size structures and, and specify structures. Um, if you're familiar enough with it, you'll know that the scour requirement for that lab testing protocol is to reduce effluent concentrations below 20 milligrams per liter. Um, and the highest uh, scour testing flow rate that I've seen come out of that is, I think, 3 CFS currently, which is two times the treatment flow rate. Um, so, but we're looking here, so at 3 CFS, uh, trying to get under 20 milligrams per liter for that testing protocol versus what we see with the preserver at 15 milligrams per liter. Uh, at 16 CFS, it's a really, it's a really big difference. It, it helps to. Lance, I apologize. No. I, I interrupted you a little bit, but I was moving your mouse. You have to take control back over again. I was trying to close the participants window. Uh, <laughs> and I did interrupt that last thing you were saying when you're talking about NJ cats. I don't know if a lot of people know about it. Um, but no. I want to, I want to mention two things. One are, are the manufacturers of swirl units, um, are they telling people that they, during high flows, those could be reintroduced or the scour could happen and that the sediment could be reintroduced or is that not really common knowledge? Yeah, I don't think so. I, I think this is, so the NJ um, DEP testing protocol is very common. That's why I bring it up. So I, I think that a lot of people probably are familiar with it or have heard of it. And if okay. you aren't and you want to learn more, definitely feel free to reach out to me after this or research it. Um, but it's a it's a good testing methodology and i want to bring it up just for comparison purposes because i think the methodology we use for the preserver is uh, more accurately reflects real world conditions just because the njdp um, testing methodology it just doesn't test the removal efficiency testing the target uh, removal uh, the psd everything all of that is is great um, where it, it just isn't sufficient as not testing the scour flow rate to a high enough level to okay. mimic what we see in real world conditions. Thank you for that. And then we do have one question and you're gonna to get to it. I already know, cause I've seen your presentation. Uh, any concerns with the preserver with regards to sewer maintenance access to the manhole? And I'm gonna say answer live and I'm gonna stop touching the screen so you could take back over and you'll be able to get to that when you talk about maintenance. Thank you. Sure, yeah, so uh, maintenance question. <clears throat> So we, we uh, number one, have an open top on both components. So uh, a lot of times, depending on the depth of the structure, you are able to access C into the, the pipe. Pipes are also accessible from the other sides. Um, worst case, if you were ha to have to remove one, they're fairly easy to remove both. Um, use just two uh, concrete anchors on each side. So if access to the pipe were still harder, it would require um, confined space entry, removing two bolt or two nuts and um, gaining access to the pipe in that manner. But I really, I haven't even heard of anyone having to, to do that to access a pipe to maintain it. Um, if that were the case, it would be extremely unlikely and, and infrequent. Oh, I'll try. 
there you got it again you're controlling it if you click on the screen and hit the space bar it should give your arrow keys back sorry about that no problem just trying to get it figured out here you want me to try to advance it yeah go ahead all right it's not coming up for me well so let me do this i'll take away controls and get back to you i had to do that because we've got another q a so it's kind of hard to control both <laughs> Um, I think what I'll do is I'll take a picture of this Q and A and just give you the controls back and I won't do it again. We'll, we'll wait until the very end to get to the questions. So sure. let me do, um, actually, oh, you were doing it. So here, yeah, you got it. So I think if you click on it, you should be able to drive the bus. Okay. Click in the middle of the screen, hit the space bar on your keyboard and it might give your arrows back. Didn't work. Yeah, it doesn't want to work for some reason. Well, that's user error on my part. So I will I will just completely take control away from you. Oh, like that's fine. Control. I'm not advancing real fast here, so that's fine. Well, um, that could be it. So um, you know, I'll resend them to you here, Lance. So it should pop back up, and that should re reset it. So anyway, um, so now kind of moving on to the benefit that the skimmer provides. Uh, so any anything that... Skimmers are very common. You've all probably had some experience with uh, a, some skimmer or another skimmer. Uh, the preserver does have some nice aspects that other skimmers do not provide, which I'll cover here in a little bit. But in general, skimming um, helps to address the problem we see here with floatable pollutants, typically trash, hydrocarbons, you know, grease. We, we do see that at including a skimmer in a structure also helps to remove organic content uh, typically in uh, leaves. So when we see a storm, uh, we usually see leaves floating at the, the during a storm. Once they get in the structure, the, the skimmer traps them. They become waterlogged after the storm subsides and they, they go down to the sump. And that's uh, a little bit of speculation on my part, but based on the organic content that we've seen in our lab samples from our field studies, that's what I, I'm assuming is happening because we had some very high organic uh, content in areas that had heavy leaf loading and skimmers included. So um, you can advance the slide. Okay, I, I, I was hoping you'd be able to. I was, I was so excited waiting for it to click. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, uh, no, what might, might, might have happened, I may have just locked up my, there you go. Okay. Do you, want to, do you want to go again? No, I'm good here. So, um, so the solution we're talking about uh, skimming in general, really. So we're forcing outflow below the water surface um, before it is able to get to the outlet and exit the structure. So uh, the skimmer is watertight. It's uh, got seals at the manhole wall as well as between each sheet of HDP that we use for a skimmer. Um, effectively trapping any any floatable pollutants. Um, we do, similar to the dissipator, accommodate pipe sizes up to 48 inch. Um, it's adjustable. Again, this is very difficult to do in comparison to the dissipator. Um, and we use uh, basically these uh, stainless steel arches and then a larger sleeve here that um, has multiple uh, positions where we can adjust to expand it if necessary to accommodate pipe protrusions or work around obstructions like we talked about before. Uh, again, fully retrofitable through 24 inch opening. Um, I'll talk more about the structural design here on the next slide. Uh, just like dissipator, it can function alone. And we've got all the performance uh, information testing. Uh, again, easy to install and maintain. This, this, as an example, this is a very large structure seven foot diameter, 36 inch components. We only make one larger component for each um, inlet and outlet. And this took the contractor their first time installing the preserver an hour and a half to do both of those components, probably about half an hour for the dissipator, about an hour for the skimmer. And that's, it's a relatively, you know, there's a skimmer frame here, um, decent amount of bolts, um, it goes, goes pretty quick and it's, they're both relatively easy components to install. Next slide, please. <laughs> <laughs> so structural design, this is something, like I said, we focus uh, quite a bit on. Um, number one, we don't want owners to have a problem. Uh, we really don't want to send these out and uh, lose sleep over it when it rains either. Uh, we, we really don't want to have a problem, and we really haven't. Um, so as you can see, it's an extremely, um, I don't know, uh, robust 
structural design. You can see the guy kind of standing on it as he screws it together here. Uh, this this model in particular for 36 inch pipe, again, it accommodates uh, flows or it's designed um, before any factors of safety uh, are forces are calculated using 10 feet of head over 36 inch pipe. So this one will accommodate 100 CFS um, before we add any factors of safety to it. Um, it's very, very robust. Uh, and another thing that I could point out here too is uh, really the, the structural component of the design is in the frame itself. It's entirely possible to sheet it with something other than uh, HDP if you didn't want to use it for skimming, if you wanted to use it for screening. We've had people propose it for screening. We've had people use them or propose them for uh, diversion weirs in a structure. Um, so uh, you can use it in other capacities. Typically, we, we are selling it as a skimmer, though. Next page, please. So, and this is what we're, we're trying to avoid. This is a, a project we got pulled into where um, city was having problems with flooding during small store events. And upon inspection, they found you know, more of a, a traditional skimmer in the structure that uh, it's a, a large structure um, and a large outlet pipe and it had failed. So uh, in this case, one of the things I like point out with this is um, if you were to inspect this after installation, I think this would probably look perfect. It would look great. Um, part of the problem with the traditional skimmer is um, it's a benefit and drawback, right? You have the closed top, which during high flows, you're not worried about overtopping. Um, however, you also can't see it to your outlet. Um, and and it, where is this pipe right here? This Did the contractor do a good job of um, you know, making the pipe connection as flush as possible, or is the pipe sticking out almost to the front of the skimmer? <clears throat> it's something to be aware of when you're maybe using a traditional skimmer like this. It's good to be there for installation, make sure um, it's going in right. So based on this and what we see, I mean, the pipe could be as far as right here, if you're kind of following the, where this uh, device failed. So you can hit forward, Bill, or is that me? You did it. We're back, oh. baby. <laughs> hey, we're back. All right. Perfect. <laughs> so you look at this in comparison to our design. Um, this this really is something that's not going to happen with ours. So the, the, one of the things, and you saw the, uh, so we use, we use to calculate our forces. Well, number one, structurally, we were testing it in the laboratory through a high flow rate, but lab uh, pumps typically only have a, a limited amount of flow capacity. So we did it as much as we could in the lab. That was that 16 CFS. Um, so when we're talking about running, wanting to design this to accommodate 100 CFS, uh, we moved to computational fluid dynamics, which was the uh, calculated image you saw on the previous slide. Um, and what we saw, what that showed us is that forces at the skimmer are much higher than the inlet. You're really getting pressure on the front from flow hitting it. You're also getting suction from the outlet pipe on the back side of it. So how, how close you locate your skimmer to the outlet um, is impactful on the amount of forces that it needs to be designed to withstand. Um, and that's all accommodated or accounted for with our skimmer. We actually assumed that the skimmer would be placed or installed directly against the pipe when we designed it. Uh, for structural purposes. So all uh, throughout our structural calcs, um, just very conservative. It's, it's something that, uh, you know, it comes with comes with peace of mind using the, the, the preserver for either component. Um, another thing I want to point out here, <clears throat> like we said, you can use either component uh, alone or in tandem. Um, that's another benefit, especially when you're talking about using this um, in lieu of a traditional swirl separator or vortex separator. It's, it's one of the cost savings associated with preserver. Number one, we're typically always going to be less expensive than a swirl separator. That's one of the benefits. Um, I also, in my opinion, and hopefully convince you of this today as well, we also <clears throat> are more effective than traditional swirl separators. So you're getting a better product at a lower price, um, but you're also paying only for what you need. So if you, um, with a skimmer, for example, we actually find that uh, we, you know, in this case, this is a good application of the skimmer. There's a lot of material that needs to be removed from skimming, but a lot of watersheds where we're using this are relatively clean for floatable pollutants. So 
um, we actually see in our sales that skimmers are, we sell three dissipators to each skimmer. So skimmers are used less frequently than, than dissipators. A lot of times people are targeting sediment. They don't, <clears throat> if they don't need the functionality of the skimmer with the preserver, they don't need to pay for it. So that kind of sums up um, basically each component and what, what they're used for. Um, I do want to kind of quick back up and tell the story of how we kind of got where we are in Minnesota and how we got to even, you know, develop the preserver, what, what led to that point. So it really started with MnDOT uh, becoming an <clears throat> MS4 and being regulated under the MPDS phase two requirements. So they needed to show, um, you know, that they were treating stormwater and they needed to show what they were doing on an annual basis and, and load, load removed of pollutants and specifically for treatment structures or manhole um, gravity separators um, that, that pollutant is sediment, right? So they needed a way to quantify or predict performance for what they already had in the ground. They wanted to get credit for what they already had installed on, on their numerous projects and miles and miles of highways, right? So they <clears throat> commissioned the U of M for testing um, and U of M took a fresh approach to this uh, as, as a new problem and, and didn't really lean on existing testing protocols. So they're trying to um, find the best way to, to do this to meet that end result really. So they kind of worked backwards from what they needed and what they needed to test to get to that point. So they <clears throat> looked at it overall. They said, well, we need to determine two things. Um, number one, we're, we're gonna look at uh, historic rainfall in an average annual load removed. Um, and to do so, we need to know what our, our uh, removal efficiency capacities of these uh, various proprietary devices. Uh, but then we also, need to know how well they retain that removed material during high flow. So it's really a, a common theme here. How do, how do these devices work during high flows? It's very important to the overall um, removal efficiencies and what's in the structure at the end of the year. Um, so uh, they took those two and they're able to um, combine them to determine the end goal. But they also, during this process, had to think of and, and they were tasked with this from MnDOT as well. Uh, MnDOT said, well, not only do we own a lot of different types of proprietary devices, we also own several different model numbers or different diameters or sizes of each one. So the methodology that they came up with, they're also tasked at making it uh, essentially had to be a similarity equation as well. So they came up with a uh, unitless equation that uh, was flexible and able to predict accurately removal efficiencies on an annual basis and, and load removed um, by varying the structure diameter, the inlet and outlet pipe sizes, the particle size or particle size distribution, and the flow rates. So it's a very flexible methodology. It's a very accurate methodology. Um, and just by taking that fresh look at it, I think they did a really good job of coming up with um, uh, a new way of looking at this in a more accurate way to model these structures. So once once they finished looking at gravity separators for MnDOT, MnDOT said, well, we also have a lot of some manholes that we want credit for. So they did the same thing with some manholes. And like I said before, what they saw was they can remove sediment, but they just can't retain it during the high flows. And that's where the preserver uh, comes from. So it's primary purpose is to be able to be retrofit into a some manhole and prevent that scour from occurring. So we did test this, um, you know, we came up with a design, tested it in a full scale um, setting. We did this in Iowa. Uh, it meets all current ASTM requirements. And <clears throat> this is a good visual. It's probably a little choppy um, coming through online here, but uh, we also have these videos on our website if you want to go take a look. But on the right, you have uh, uh, unimpeded flow. This is 12, both of these pictures are 12 CFS going through our test structure. So on the right, without a dissipator or skimmer installed, on the left with the dissipator and skimmer. So you can really see how the dissipator is working. Um, it's 
It's uh, obstructing that, that high energy flow jet. It's taking the flow. It's controlling the flow dynamics, and it's also reducing the energy in that in that flow jet. So, um, and this is this is a relatively high flow. This would be preventing scour at this point in time. But you can envision at lower flows how it would function similarly and enhance sediment removal. So results from that, we talked about this at 16 CFS, uh, effluent concentration under 15 milligrams per liter. Uh, and like I said, the, the side benefit is that we also see a doubling of sediment removal during low flows. We see that in our lab testing. We see it when we use our annualized calculation uh, methodology in comparison to a sump manhole. Um, and we also see it in our field observations, which we'll talk about a bit more here. So we can use this testing, like I said, to um, basically size a structure similar to uh, any other swirl separator, any other vortex separator, any other gravity separator on the market. Um, and so in, in this case, we could size it to a OK 110 removal at a specific flow rate. We've also put these calculus together for NJDEP, 50% removal. Um, and again, picking on NG. DEP a little bit, <clears throat> um, we can use this kind of to illustrate my point where the testing requirement for NJDEP and SCOUR is that um, your calculated treatment flow rate, you have to double that flow rate and show that you uh, don't SCOUR or your effluent concentration isn't above 20 milligrams per liter. Um, here <clears throat> you can see where the preserver's effluent concentration reach, reaches 20 milligrams per liter. And it's on average about eight times the treatment flow rate. So it really kind of helps illustrate how effective the preserver is. We also have a design spreadsheet. This is an this is what MINDAT would need to quantify their loads on an annual basis. Um, this is just an, an example from the Omaha area uh, using uh, NJDEP. So we can design to a treatment goal like I was just talking about. However, is that the best use of a gravity separator? Uh, and you know, it is is a, using a gra gravity separator as a standalone treatment device the best use for a gravity separator? And what we found in Minnesota that is that it, it probably isn't. You look at all of the all of the um, options we have for stormwater treatment uh, this day and age. We're looking at you know, infiltration, biofiltration, filters, the level of treatment we can get. We're talking about um, you know, 80% uh, sediment removal as well as removal of dissolved particles or dissolved pollutants, sorry. Um, so if we're looking at a, a manhole gravity separator, the capabilities of, of any one of these units really for removal is we're talking about probably uh, fine sand and greater size sediment particles. We're not talking about dissolved um, nutrients. So that level of treatment, what is the best use for it? And what we've determined in Minnesota is that it's, it's probably better suited as pretreatment uh, than it is for a standalone treatment. And this <clears throat> Minnesota, um, this comes through the MPCA as part of the uh, MPDAS construction permit. Uh, they made pretreatment a requirement in 2018, and they, they have some really good wording in here. I'm just gonna read quick. It says, in many applications, infiltration or stormwater ponds, the BMP would not be properly used if pretreatment is ignored. The simple reason for the use of pretreatment techniques is the necessity to keep a BMP from being overloaded primarily by sediment. So I think that's worded very well and concisely, um, kind of kind of helps to show the, the benefit of pretreatment. So, <clears throat> Take going back to this picture and how effective pretreatment is. Just envision this catch basin in the foreground. This is your pretreatment device. So you get 50% sediment removal of what comes in there. That uh, you maintain it once a year, and that costs you $150, $200 every time you maintain it, relatively inexpensive. Versus um, cleaning this pond out. Um, if you had to clean this pond out, uh, probably not uncommon to hear. $100,000 or disposal fees are very expensive if it's contaminated. You have specialized disposal, which can raise the cost even further. Um, so now if you have to maintain this every 20 or 30 years, if you get 50% removal from your 
preacher event, you're talking about maintaining it every 40 or 60 years and pushing those costs up. It's easy to see how um, pre-treatment is, is cost effective over the long run. So and like I've been talking about, what I think is important for these devices is how they actually work in the real world. It's not uncommon to see um, device manufacturers have an animated video showing how a device should work or, or works ideally, um, and less frequent to see <clears throat> device manufacturers actually show how it does work in the real world. Um, but that to me is, is what's important and is the end goal. You want to have material in your structure to maintain at the end of the year. Uh, you want to keep as much material out of your downstream BMP as possible. Currently, we um, well, we started our field monitoring program in 2017 to, to do exactly that. Uh, currently, we have three um, case studies on <clears throat> our website. You can go check those out. Uh, we have two more uh, under development. So we have the results. We just need to finalize them, get them up there. What you're going to see consistently through these is that the preserver removes sediment well, uh, also retains it when we get big storms coming through. We're measuring material in the structures um, being removed, you know, <laughs> on either, uh, you know, tons of material that we're actually pulling out of these on an annual basis, um, or even cubic yards of material that we're pulling out. So uh, they're very, they, they really do a good job of showing how well it works in the real world. So before we end this, I just want to point out, we do have a lot of materials on our website. You can go to MomentumENB.com. Or if you go to the preserver.com, it'll get you there as well. Um, we have two one and a half to two and a half uh, minute videos on there. If you want to learn more, there's three of those on there. Um, if you have someone else that you uh, think might be interested in getting up to speed, that's a good place to direct them to as well. Those videos will get them up to speed very quickly in a short amount of time. Um, we also have a lot of downloads available. Um, design tools, um, standard details, our case studies, um, installation manuals. Um, it's all on there. Uh, please feel free to go take a look, download what, you, what you're interested in. So um, just saying this is my last slide. <clears throat> I just want to say that for those of you that are new to the preserver um, and feel like you might be taking a chance if you're going to try it out, I do want to assure you that um, it's, it's really been put through the ringer already. <clears throat> it may not um, it's kind of the, one of the better known secrets in the stormwater market um, currently, and in, in my opinion, we haven't um, expanded outside of the upper Midwest, which we're located in Minnesota. So we've kind of been growing solely geographically, but um, been growing, uh, it's becoming much, much more popular. So I think we're going to be seeing more of it. If you feel like you're taking a chance on it, um, you don't have to. It's, it's been put through the ringer. Um, like I said, structural design, you can sleep well at night when it rains and you have very big rainstorm events. We've done our homework. Um, <clears throat> it works very well. And if you are new to it, I hope you give it a try. And with that, I'm done. Well, you are. And I, I was trying to get to uh, I, 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 my wife and kids will tell you how funny I am. I was going to get to a song. I think a song's all the time for every situation. And then there's a song by ABBA called Take a Chance on Me. So, <laughs> I'm not saying this should be your theme song, but I'm saying I, I vouch for you. And I think you should take a chance on Lance. And that even rhymes. So <laughs> let me shut that off there. I couldn't even, I couldn't get it started, then I couldn't stop it. I'm going to take over the screen. And Lance, I apologize. I bumped this mouse so many times. I think if people were paying attention earlier when I said those pictures of our warehouses that are really clean and tidy, they aren't my garage. They're also not my office. I have so many things piled up that as I was taking some written notes, I kept bumping my mouse and I would see it changed your cool laser pointer a couple of times to my arrow. And I apologize for that. So I do want to say that Lance's QR code on screen works great. When I'm doing these uh, webinars, I sometimes take pictures of the screen and send them to my coworkers. And that's Quick Supply, ASP, Bowman, Cascade. And I give them ideas and tell them things I'm thinking of. And that QR code keeps popping up every time I take a picture of the screen with it on there. So I'm going to leave that on screen before I go to my next slide. But we have some questions and I'm super excited about these, Lance. So my planted questions that I had, like somebody in the Saturday Night Live audience, are unnecessary. We have real questions from real people. And you already answered the one about maintenance. And 
Tim has a couple of questions on here, some good ones. You might know Tim, Zach. Uh, can the preserver be added to a conventional manhole without a sump? Go ahead and chime in, Lance. So, yeah, for that question, we have had the preserver used in different ways when people are looking for energy dissipation in a structure um, and not targeted for sediment purposes. Uh, so we did design it to target sediment removal, uh, obviously, but um, we have added installed where people are concerned about manhole integrity over time and they want to get some sort of energy dissipation in there where they have a steep pipe coming in. It has been installed successfully in that um, regard. Uh, other than that, I haven't really seen it used in other applications. Well, I'll have to quit telling people no then, because I always think that they need to have some three foot storage or more to store the sediment that's going to settle out. Yeah. If, if you're targeting sediment, you do need something. It and has he to also, have a place to go. He also asked about, could it be used in a rectangular structure instead of a round structure? Yep. Yep. That's another advantage of it. So the dissipator is easier to do in that example, our stock. Um, basically the, the flexibility of, again, of the HDP and the dissipator in general, um, it is um, adjustable. So usually need it to be longer when you're using a, a, the larger your structure gets and especially when you get into a flat wall connection. So, but you can do that definitely. Well, um, we just with our stock components, skimmer is more difficult. Uh, we would probably need to look at a custom bracket manufacturer for that, um, but it is possible. Okay, that helps me because we do get asked that question. And then um, Tim also asked, and, and Lance, you know how this is. Sometimes if you included this information in the presentation, um, some things aren't as sticky for us when we're an audience member or we play tricks in our mind on how we remember the answer. Um, the question is about standard losses for the preserver as you're calculating the hydraulic grade line. Sure, yeah, that's uh, so did a couple of um, great things at University of Iowa that uh, improved upon prior um, test methodologies. One of them was <clears throat> they used to weigh the manholes um, to determine sediment uh, <laughs> weights, essentially, but you had to weigh a concrete structure or a fiberglass Ooh. structure plus the water, plus the sediment, and then the difference be before and after to get a result, which was fairly inaccurate. University of Iowa used uh, lasers and software to correct for refraction when measuring through water. Um, which was uh, very cool. As a nerd, I really appreciate that. <laughs> and uh, very accurate, very accurate. improved the accuracy of the test quite a bit from prior tests. Um, the other thing we did was <clears throat> with hydraulics, we had to do one of those ASTM requirements is a hydraulics test for the, for, uh, the structure and, and basically uh, losses, right? So uh, we followed that protocol. We tested for losses. We actually created an equation that helps um, to predict head losses, not only in our uh, setup that we tested, which is very specific, but for any uh, outlet diameter or flow rate. So we have an equa a unitless equation that's adjustable. You can just enter in those two um, specific um, basic variables uh, specific to your install, and you can have a, an estimated uh, water level in your structure which if you have if you need to see if you have flooding upstream if, if we're uh, creating more head losses you can enter that in as a tail water in your say modeling software and and run it upstream so but specifically to our test setup i could speak to that and that was a 24 inch pipe in and out and at our highest flow rate of 16 cfs our head losses for each component was half a foot above and beyond, um, you know, just with all the components. So we're adding half foot of head loss for the skimmer. We're adding half foot of head loss for the dissipator. If you're using both, we're adding a foot of head loss at 16 CFS. So you'll be able to help us when we get specific projects and there's there's no charge to, or obligation to have you help with that upfront design, right? Nope, nope. We'll put together project specific details. Uh, uh, any any calculations like that we can handle up front. It's just um, we we appreciate people using the preserver and specifying it. We're more than happy to sure. help them do that correctly. So well, we got about four minutes left. We still have a few questions to get through. I was going to get back to your case study as well. Um, does your website include some of the equations for head loss? You um, yeah, we have here? we have a summary of our test document on there, and that equation is included in that. Um, okay. If somebody wants uh, more guidance, uh, definitely feel free to reach out to me. I'm more happy to help. 
All right, let's have let's have everybody do, know that they can do that with a survey monkey. We're going to send out at the end. Um, you want to get back and you bet, Tim, you're welcome. Absolutely. Um, do you want to get back to your case study or do you want to answer a couple of these other questions? Because that case study really opened an eye for me. I went and cleaned out a curbside device that's not yours, just a shallow mm -hmm. curbside device this spring a month ago. And it was only serving maybe a quarter of an acre and somewhere between a quarter to an acre of a, of a residential area. And I cleaned it out and I cleaned out the bioretention system that was supposed to be protecting and in total, I got four trash bags of heavy, mucky, yucky sediment, mm -hmm. leaves, trash. And I weighed them at, I think, 136 pounds. And that was four trash bags in just one system. And I had mm -hmm. six systems in one city block. So I only did one sixth of the city block. You know, I think if people are interested, uh, they can go and look at the case studies and, and follow up with questions through okay. our website or through you or through me at my contact info here. Um, I think that's a really good point, though. I think what um, we've realized with Preserver, too, is that <clears throat> with the amount of material that we see in our case studies, if I try to back calculate that with published loading rates of sediment, where we would get, I, I, calculate, I can't even show our removal efficiency because it comes out as 300% removal, right, which we all know is impossible. Um, so I think that's a really good point in that um, if you have a device that's working correctly, um, I think the published loading values or, you know, runoff concentrations of pollutants, um, especially sediment, is, is underestimating what's coming off our roadways. We, in practice, have seen uh, much higher capture rates of what we're, what we're, what we're capturing and removing. So it's, it's incredible. And it's impossible that we would ever collect it again out of a body of water downstream. So. Right. A couple other questions, and we're, we're getting close on time. Um, okay, so with an open top on the skimmer, they must be talking about, do you worry about trash or hydro hydrocarbons overtopping the structure? And, and do you use a hydrocarbon absorption material? Um, yeah, that's a great question. So I would say no product's perfect, and we have an open top um, on purpose, really, because it's the best way to make the product retrofitable. Um, and we also like the access and maintenance uh, um, perspective or, or advantage that it, it provides. So, but the downside is that it is possible to overtop in a large storm. We address that by providing freeboard. So um, the standard freeboard is half of the outlet pipe diameter minimum um, or, or greater. So if for, a, and we find that that's, sufficient uh, and the picture you saw of the kind of trash capture um, very rarely are we building up to that point if you have a specific project where you are concerned about that we have a couple options one would be to upsize the skimmer um, the other is to create a custom skimmer that has a higher um, freeboard it's very easy to just manufacture new brackets um, and add more of those arches up higher use a use a taller pieces of plastic to cheat that. So we have a lot of design flexibility and manufacturing flexibility. The downside of custom designs is we don't really charge more for them. It's not a big price. It's more of a time issue. It does take time to get them designed and get them manufactured. I learned something today. Thank you for that. So we are right up against our time. So we'll get to the other questions in writing and I'll have Lance help answer those. Uh, Lance, thank you very much. You did an awesome job as always. I appreciate you, my friend. I will Likewise. capture I've captured these questions and we'll send out a survey monkey to everyone and we'll include Lance in this dialogue and we'll provide every attendee the written answers to all of the questions along with your PDH certificate. And please remember to reach out to me or Lance and I'll show our contact information there, I guess, um, for any questions you have and to schedule any follow-up meetings where we can have an open mic and let you all talk. Thanks, Lance, for bearing with me and all my different things that kind of made it, I guess, interesting. <laughs> yeah, no, I appreciate the entertainment. That's good. <laughs> all right, buddy. We'll talk to you again. Thanks. Take care. Thank you. You too. All right. Bye-bye.